Thanks for joining us here at the Research Her, the show working to improve the health disparities for women of color, one topic at a time. And I am Alicia. I'm here learning and growing with you as we research our way to wellness. There was no way that I was going to have a podcast called The Research Her and not invite this person who, if I had to name a song that just described how I felt about this person, it would be, you're my greatest and my latest, my greatest, my greatest inspiration. There's no way I can pay you back, but the plan is to show you that I understand. You are appreciated. I know that that was two songs, but you know, one plus one equals three if you don't wear a condom. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about Erica Jordan. Erica Jordan graduated from Aurora University with her bachelor's, then moved on and got her master's in school counseling from Governor State University and then got her EDD from Loyola University, where she became Dr. Jordan. And we'll talk about her research and her research topic all throughout the show, so I'll let her describe that to you right now. She is a school counselor for a high school in Chicago. She's been working for Chicago Public Schools. It's been about 20 years where she's been everything from a teacher to a assistant principal, but now she's in love with her job as a school counselor because she loves her kids, and we'll talk about that too. A conversation with my mother is perfect for the show. We had a great conversation about her journey. And then unexpectedly, we started talking about my childhood. So it starts off very formal. And then we get to talking about, you know, some other stuff. So stick around. I'm going to apologize in advance for the poor audio. But this was my first interview. I'm glad it was with somebody who is patient and who loves me. I didn't know what I was doing. I ain't gonna lie. Now, let me put you in conversation with my biggest inspiration, Dr. Erica Jordan. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. Hi, Dr. Jordan. Okay, so let's just get started. Why did you pursue a doctoral degree? It was not something that I thought I could do initially. When I graduated from high school, I could hardly write. So when I got to college and I had to write my first paper, I was devastated because I hadn't learned those skills. And I had to teach myself how to write. I never formally learned how to write. And then, as you know, I got pregnant with a daughter. And for some reason, that just really pushed me. I really wanted to be a great role model for you. As you were. <laughs> as, thank you. Thank you. I really wanted to just be a great role model for you. I didn't even think about my doctorate till after I finished my master's degree and watching Tiffany, your auntie Tiffany go through her doctorate program. And I was there every step of the way. I saw her apply to the program. I saw her go through the program. I was at her graduation. I read her dissertation. That was the first dissertation I had ever read. And I was just so inspired. And I just wanted to achieve that level of greatness. But more importantly, I just wanted to really let you see and know that there's no limits to what you can do. I went from can't write a a paragraph to writing a 400-page dissertation. That was huge. That was huge to me. That is huge. So let's get into your dissertation and your research topic. What um, was the inspiration behind uh, your research topic that you picked for your dissertation? So my dissertation topic was female principals that lead in the same school that they once taught. So I knew those type of women. I was one of my mentors, Dr. Rose Lee, was 
at one point we were class. We, we, uh, she was my mentor. She was a second grade teacher. When I was a third grade teacher, she taught me so much and she helped me develop my teaching skills. And then she grew into her leadership skills and became a principal at the same school that she taught. And I met a few other women that started as teachers, classroom teachers, and then they became principals. And I realized that has that have to be a challenge to go from colleague to now I'm your superior. Not only does that have an impact on the the professional relationship, but it also has an impact on the personal and the social relationships that you have with other people in your building. And I was just interested in studying that phenomenon. I enjoy writing my dissertation. And that's one of the things I tell people who ask me about getting a doctorate. Should I do it? What are what is your suggestion? And I just tell them, find a topic that you truly enjoy. If you enjoy it, it won't even feel like you're doing work. And that's what I truly felt like I wasn't working because I was very involved and very interested in what the data and what the women were saying. Yeah. And like you said, you knew a few women, but like, was it hard to get enough women enough to participate? And was there a specific number of women you knew you wanted to study? And was it hard to fulfill that, like that number? No, not at all. Um, Actually, I got a list of all the principals in the state of Illinois. And I just sent out a mass blast of letters. And I wanted to interview 10 women. I ultimately interviewed 11 because I was just so engaged in their story. And I was just I was really interested in the story. I really enjoyed the topic that I had selected. And it was very therapeutic, I felt, for those ladies. Finally, somebody listening to me. I It was supposed to be an hour session where I would come in. I sent them the questions beforehand. I spoke to women throughout different suburbs of Chicago. I never went to a school in Chicago because I would have had to go through Chicago Public Schools, RIB, and I didn't want to go through all that. Um, what is what is the RIB? What does that mean? I don't even know if I'm saying the right letters. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> but it's there. It's her. But ultimately, it's the it's the internal review board, IRB, IRB. Yep, internal review board who makes sure that you are following um, ethical guidelines when interviewing, when having contact with people. Chicago public schools have their own IRB which you have to go through and it's a lot more stringent and it may have held up me getting through my process as quickly as I wanted to. So I did stay away from Chicago public schools principals, but I sent to all different counties, Cook County, DePage County, and I found a lot of women and they were very open to sharing their story, sharing their trajectory into leadership. It was very therapeutic. It was therapeutic for them. Uh, for those who don't quite understand that process of like getting in contact with these women, is it as simple as putting throwing out like an email to a specific like database or how was it getting your email or getting the contact information for these women? Do you just go somewhere and like pick it up? Like how how mm-hmm. is that process? It's, 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 yeah, it's pretty much that simple. All this stuff is public. All these information we work for we are public employees and I say we because I work for Chicago Public Schools but educators are public employees when you work for public schools so it was just a matter of me asking ISB which is Illinois State Board of Education for a list of people who are in leadership roles and they sent me the list within a week or two I sent the letter they responded with the list I just went through the list and sent out letters of course, I think I may have sent out over 100 letters. And of course, I had no way of knowing. So the letter that I sent said, if you know, if you meet these criteria or if you know any one woman who meets it and I spelled out the criteria, please for my information. And these are the women who responded to me. So now you've interviewed 10 women. What did you find and is there anything that really stood out to you that was very that was beneficial for your thesis in particular in interviewing them 
there is a change in those relationships, both professional and both social. I use those interviews, that qualitative data to see how that shift became about, see how they addressed it. I think I wasn't surprised by the data that I collected because I know women who have that situation, who live that situation, and they share some of those concerns and they uh, had already shared with me. Once you become a leader, you you feel so alone, you feel so isolated. And that's pretty much validated in the interviews that I had with these women. They, they felt isolated. They were once invited to different events. They were once friends. They once went over people's home, invited to baby showers and and graduation parties, but now it becomes us versus them. Mm, they become a they become a part of the them versus being a part of the us. Absolutely, and so you 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 lose some valuable friends. You lose some of those friendships. I do recall one lady saying that as she was a teacher, she knew all the hiding spots. She knew all the different tricks they would pull as far as sneaking in, sneaking out, taking the standard lunches when you didn't, when you knew that you wouldn't get caught. And she said now that she, once she learned all those things, being a teacher, now she had an obligation and duty to make sure it didn't happen. So when someone did it, she had to call them out on the carpet. She said that did cause some problems in a friendship, but she was ready to relinquish those friendships because maintaining her positional power was important. I know that you have had some like maybe people in your life who just make it their business to never call you Dr. Jordan, even though everybody else around you at work or in that like professional setting are calling you Dr. Jordan, they still make it their business to like say Miss Jordan or Mrs. Jordan. Like how how do you handle those situations and does it make you feel any type of way? <laughs> That's a great question. And I say it's great because I know people who take it very personal. I'm not one of those people. I recognize the community that I service. And for the most part, I would say 95% of the people that I, I surround myself with, I work with my students, my my colleagues, they do respect the title. They do understand. It's very interesting when I meet a person, especially a person who's never been to college, tell me, oh, I heard getting a doctorate is real easy. It's nothing to it. I just kind of chuckle to myself because I recognize that... <laughs> Sometimes people have to say these things to themselves to make themselves feel better. But I know, and, mo- and anybody else who have earned their doctorate, I know as you go through your PhD program, you recognize that it's a lot of sacrifice. It's a lot of hard work. And I know the work I put in. I know the sweat I, I put into it. And I know that my number one goal was to be a role model for my daughter. And I tell my students this. I say, oh, your children are not going to do what you tell them to do. They're going to do what you do. They're not going to, they're going to say, if you didn't go to college, you didn't do this. Why should I do that? Well, I took all those excuses away from my daughter and look at her now. So I feel like I did what I set out to do. I'm more marketable. I'm able to have conversations in, in different settings. I met some amazing people along the way. And if I meet somebody who say Miss Jordan versus Dr. Jordan, it's okay. It's all right. I don't take it personal. It bothers me more when people say, oh, I heard getting a doctorate is easy. I don't know. I don't get moved by people who don't know. And I just chuck it off as, mm-hmm. It's a privilege. I feel a badge of honor to call myself Dr. Jordan. I feel a badge of honor to be a black face with that title. And then I do have to explain to some of my children, some of my students, that I'm not a medical doctor and that there are different type of doctors and I can't do any medical procedures on you because I do not have a medical degree. And then even explaining the difference between doctors, there's the PhD and then there's the EDD. And of course, I have the EDD, which is more of a practitioner's doctorate versus the PhD, which is more of a a research doctorate. So I do want to ask you, do you remember me um, going to school for my doctorate? Does anything about me going to school or classes stick out to you at all? Obviously, 
there would be times where you would have class at night and I would stay with Nana and things like that. But I do remember you being very just like determined more than anything. Like I just remember like, oh my, I I didn't understand it at the time, I guess. Like it was like, oh, my mama have got to go to school. Why she don't go to school? Like when I go to school and it's like, oh, she got to work. <laughs> Like, so what, I'm like, why she don't got to go to school during the time that I go to school? It was, it was like that. But that was also like, because I was a kid, I didn't really understand, um, the idea of like having to work full time because you work full time and then you, you know, you had to go to school at nighttime. So I, yeah. I definitely remember that process, but the, the amount of like hard work you had to do, I can't even, I couldn't imagine what it was like. Because I am doing it without a kid. I'm doing it without all of, like, the... You had every reason to be like, I don't have to do that. I got to do it. I got to be a mom. Like, you had every reason to kind of, like, throw in the towel and say, like, I ain't going to do that because I got to be a mother. And you chose to, to do both. You chose you chose it all. You know, you, you chose to be a mother. You chose to still go to school. And I'm and glad you all, noticed so. that because it it, it's, it is a, it's, it's a challenge when you're when you're young, I was very young when I had you, I was single. So I knew I was, I was taking a a chance on, on my, on my tribe, on the people that supported me, the people that loved you and saying, and and trusting and believing that when they say, I'll help you, I, I got you just, just stay in school. And they came through the people who said they would, they would support me and help me. They came through and, my village, my villages, your, your village, our villages is, is is dope. We have a dope village, and they made sure that I was able to get through school. And essentially, that was always important to me. My child going to college. I've always felt supported and loved. There hasn't been there. You know, there are times where I'm kind of down that certain people don't support me and certain people aren't there. But I think as I get older, I just realize they just don't have the capacity to support me like that like you know I don't really want to get into it that much but like I I just do remember always feeling like loved and supported with my my nana always being there my dad like I'm blessed in that I'm very privileged in the fact that I was able to be successfully co-parented like you were a single mother but my dad was there and loved me so much that I always felt loved. I never was seeking that. Mm-hmm. Always like, am on the what is what's next in my career? What's next in my school? What am I doing? Like it's always like I'm so focused on that. I guess bigger like academic goal or that bigger career goal. I always saw something different in you even when you were a young girl. You would want to read and you didn't. You would watch the animal channel and the health channel while your friends are watching cartoons and Hannah Montana, you were watching. Um, I remember when you were little and you were asking me for all the, you was like, I need peanut butter and apples. And I'm like, why? You said, cause I don't want to get rickets. And I said, why would you get Rick? What is rickets? Like, I didn't even know what rickets was. I had to look it up, but you had watched the show on a health channel and, you were looking at what you uh, you were very interested in health at an early age. So it's no surprise that this is your calling. Wait, Ma, can you can you tell that one story about my first race conversation? Oh, your race conversation. It was the cutest conversation. You had to be two or three. And I had a very good friend who was a nanny to a young white boy who you were probably the same age as him. And then the mother had adopted a black baby. So the baby was still under one, couldn't talk. And you and James couldn't have been more than three. And you were in the living room playing and coloring or something really low level where you could talk and do the activity that you were doing. And Kristen and I were listening to your conversation. And Elizabeth, who was the black baby, was in the room with you too. And James asked you, do you like being black? And you said, yes, I do like being black. And then you asked him, do you like being white? He said, yes, I do like being white. 
And then he said, do you think Elizabeth like being black? And you said, yes, I think Elizabeth like being black. And Chris and I just cracking up the whole time. That was your first conversation about race. You hear that, child? I've been advocating for black women since I was a young man. (laughs) You were. You said, no, Elizabeth liked being black. And I'm sure she, to this day, I wish I could find her. And so she can show you, yes, I do enjoy my blackness. You never pushed me to get a PhD. You always, like, you were like, you going to college. Like, that was, like, I don't even remember ever thinking that I could do anything outside of go to college. Like, I I knew at that time, like, you could stay home. But what do you do when you stay home? Like, I heard college is good. You go there, you get to live your best life. Like, what do you do? Exactly. Like, what do you do? And, and interesting enough, I was a first generation college student. And I did not think about anything besides going to college. I didn't think about it. I just, my mother said the same thing to me. You going to college? And I said, okay. I knew I didn't want to work. I saw my mother working. She worked very hard for many years. I saw her get up when she was tired. I saw her go to work when she was sick. I saw her sacrifice so much for her three children, her own parents. And she may work look hard. She may work look hard. And I did not want to do that yet. So college to me was my escape from what appeared to be a, a sentence. I didn't think about, I didn't even know what I wanted to do. I I didn't know what I was going to major in. You started off and as an accountant, right? I started off as an accountant major and I would fall asleep in class and I realized I cannot be an accountant. I can't get through the classes. It's so boring to me. And when I got pregnant with you, I decided I'd go into education. It made sense. And it was the best decision I made. For you, what was that connection like? It made sense. Like, because you say it made sense. What? It made sense because it gave me an opportunity to have summers off. <laughs> I said, oh, good. I'm going to become a teacher. And then I'll have the summers off and I'll be able to spend time with my daughter. Oh, with my child. I don't know what I was. I didn't know. Um, you were having a boy. Okay. I didn't know what I was having. I didn't know what I was having. But, um, I thought I would be able to be home with my child. I didn't I didn't even understand that, yeah, summer's off is a joke. You end up working the summer too because <laughs> there's some opportunities. But I it made sense. And I just said this the other day to one of my colleagues, like, I really like my job. I really like my kids. They drive me insane, but I really, really like my kids and I really like my job. And it has its ups, it has its down, but I enjoy what I do. I think I had a um, toxic work environment before. And once I got out, it was like being in a toxic relationship. And when I was finally able to leave that situation, I can appreciate anything. I think I was talking about how I was, I didn't know anything else to do but to go to college because it only made sense. And then when I had you, so many people doubted that I could finish. Like, oh, you can't finish college because you have a child and children are not going to let you finish. You're going to have to work. And you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do that. And I guess the stubborn me or the determined me was set out to prove everybody wrong. Nope. My daughter did not do anything like that. She did not keep me for my goals. As a matter of fact, after I had to. My life got so much better. It just, it got better. I became a mother and it was hard being a single mother, but I was able to leave a toxic relationship with my head and my dignity intact. I was able to finish my degree, get a master's, get a doctorate, get my own, buy my own house, buy my own car, have money in a bank. It's my life just took a turn for the best after I had you. And I really, really, truly contributed to motherhood. And I see so many young women, they get to that fork in the road and same thing. You can either make motherhood the best thing that happened to you and put all excuses aside, or you can use it as a what was me moment, as a stumbling block. 
And I'm so grateful that I was able, that motherhood was an inspiration to me. And I don't think I probably would have been that ex- inspired with a boy. <laughs> <laughs> you have a you girl, mean, I, you I, like, I, I have to. That you wore that it's a boy shirt at your baby shower <laughs> when you didn't know what you was having. Just a I did not know what I was having. I did not find out. I did not want to find out. So what? Why would? Where would, did that boldness come from? Like I'm just gonna wear this. It's a boy shirt to my baby shower, <laughs> where they're gonna be taking. And you know those were. It's like it's just happened to say boy. I didn't even notice it say a boy when I was buying the shirt, Alicia. Ma, go back and Sheesh. look at the picture. It's a big old boy. Uh, it and, say boy. And, it just say boy on oh boy. I don't know what it say. I can't find a picture. All that stuff is in Texas. Yours <laughs> is in Texas. In Texas. I <laughs> have the picture in my photo book in West Lafayette, Indiana, so I don't have access to it now either. But exactly you're that's even worse you're further <laughs> you're even further than that i said but you were you were such an easy child because you you self-monitor you were very independent you were always independent even at two like you would get up in the morning turn on your <laughs> light i don't know if i should be saying all this because it makes me sound like an awful mother but you would get up and turn on light king and i knew i had at least another hour to lay in the bed on the weekends because you were self-monitor you just want to watch lion king and eat a bowl of cereal and you could do all that at, at two and three it was just you were just such an easy child and then as you grew up you were always hard and you were harder on yourself about your grades than I ever could be. So I never said anything to you about grades, study, homework, because that was a priority to you. And I could not. It's you, you, you handled it. It's handled. I don't remember ever asking you to do your homework. As a matter of fact, I remember telling you, turn off the light and go to bed. And you're like, I'm doing my homework. And I'm like, girl, turn off the light. If it's not done, it's not going to get done. You need to get some rest. I remember you being up late, studying, downloading podcasts. I didn't even know what a podcast was. You know, you've been listening to podcasts since you were in high school. I didn't even know what a podcast was. And you were listening to them. Do you remember that? You go online and listen to people who you can learn from. So exactly. Yeah. So what you would do is, so let me, I don't know if you remember this, but I remember it so vividly. You had a teacher that had a strong accent and you struggled with understanding that science teacher. Physics. I think it was physics. It was a science class, but you would download podcasts. But while you were in high school, like this takes a whole level of consciousness. This takes responsibility and accountability to a whole nother level of consciousness. You were way light years ahead of your time because teenagers don't typically do that. They will make excuses. I can't understand her. I don't I don't want her. No, your thing was, hey, what's the topic? I'm going to self teach. I'm going to go research that topic. So you are a researcher. Before you knew you were a researcher, because once you were given the topic, you took it upon yourself to do the research and understand the topic and understand the content so that you would not be able to use her accent as your excuse. And I thought that was super cool. And I just like, oh, my God, where did this child come from? Because I certainly in your age would have blamed the teacher. (laughs) Like you, well, you know, I can't understand the teacher. I remember you received a B in a math class at the end of the semester, and you went to the teacher. You said, "I'm gonna handle it." I said, "Well, if it, you received a B in the class, and according to the syllabus you were given at the beginning of the year, maybe you got a ninety percent as your final grade. A ninety percent on the syllabus was an A." Throughout the year, some things change, and they changed a, a A to a 95% or something to that effect, So, or maybe a 92%. And so when you went to the teacher and told her, um, you gave me a B, I should have got an A. And she said, no, an A is a 92 to a, a, a 100. And you said, no, it's a 92 and 100. And you went to your locker, got your syllabus that you had in your folder that you had 
probably three hole punched and put it in the binder and had it still intact. And you said, this is what you gave us at the beginning of the school year. And this is what I operated out off of. If it changed, you did not tell us. I remember the teacher telling me, I'll change it this time. But you said, all I needed you to do was change it this time. <laughs> I said, this child here. But you advocated for yourself, and, and but you did it in such a, a mature way. You didn't go get aggressive or or funky with her. You just said, hey, this is what you gave me. Now, if it changed, you didn't change the syllabus. You didn't give us an updated syllabus. So this is what I operated off of. Do you remember that? No. No, I don't. I remember, remember that. that. And mm-hmm. you came back to me. You said, it's handled. She changed it to an A. She told me, I remember your little thing too. She told me, this, I'm doing it this time, Alicia. And I told her, that's all you have to do is it this time. <laughs> this time, yeah. But it comes from being organized, knowing you, but you, you were, or, you were an organized person. So it was, it was your destiny. I'm organized in school. This room right now, though. <laughs> So, you know that this is the Research Her. Yes. Yes. Can I give a shout out to my mother? Hey, Ma, I made it. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So, one of the big themes of the show is to talk about health-related topics. For you, I have two questions. Uh, What is one thing that you do to stay mentally healthy? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. I faith journal almost every day. I find a Bible verse. I I read it. I soak it in. I talk about it. I pray on it. But I love, I love, love, love. You know, I, I have an addiction to stationery. I'm a fountain pen addict. But more importantly, I like to put my thoughts to paper. And I enjoy that time that I have to just just pray on what's going on, not to pray for things to happen the way I want them to, but to pray for whatever God's design that it, his will be done and that I have the courage to follow along with that will. So, and it helps me. It's very, it's, it's a release for me. That time that I have faith journaling is very important to me. What is something that you do for your health, your physical health? I like to watch the news while I'm on the treadmill. So get up in the morning around 5, 30 or 6 before I get ready for work and just look at the news and be on the treadmill since I'm, I want to watch the news anyway and do two things at one time. That is it. Thank you for being on the show. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so excited. And don't cut out my part while I say hello to my mother. Hi, mom. <laughs> okay. Okay. I love you. Bye. <laughs> I love you too. Thank you for listening to The Research Her. If you enjoyed this episode, one, it's more of those where this one came from. Just go look on the little tab and get you some more. And also, if you want to connect with me, you can connect with me at The Research Her on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Or you can reach me at TheResearchHer.com. Hope to hear from you soon.